Yeah. I don't really think I have to introduce you, Max, do I? But um, I try. I'm happy for anything. <laughs> My fellow Austrian, Max, the guy who's trying to beat Facebook. Uh, yeah, talking <laughs> him a little bit. Um, <coughs> pardon my French. Okay, how long have we been at it now? One and a half years, two years, more than two years. What's that? How like long have we been at it now? Have you been at it? Facebook generally? Yeah. 2011, seven years soon. Seven years. <laughs> Whoops, I missed the beginning there. Yeah. <laughs> It's a long story. <laughs> you all know what that means? Yeah, somebody who does not know what that means? Wow, <laughs> I'm impressed. Or they just don't want to. <laughs> so yeah, basically, there are three procedures. We had a couple of, um, we had like the first three years in Ireland, which we took back because the DPC there, the authority didn't really want to do much of a job. The cleaning woman left the job. You said that. <laughs> um, and then there was actually the Safe Harbor case, which I'm going to talk about today, which started in 2013. It's still pending right now in Irish courts. It went all the way to Luxembourg, to the Court of Justice, back to Ireland, and now back up to the Court of Justice. So That's it's true, didn't it? an endless ping pong. And there is a class action we're actually um, having at the Court of Justice right now, and we're waiting for the judgment on that um, to see if we can enforce privacy through class action. So, yeah. We're basically going through all the options of privacy enforcement to not just have stuff in the law, but probably in practice at some point as well. <laughs> Isn't that nice when friends do the job for you? Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so please, let's have another big hand for Max Schrems giving you the privacy shield lipstick on a pig. <laughs> Cool. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, sorry for anybody that has to translate me because I'm very fast at talking and um, probably it's sometimes hard to understand. People tell me I'll try to slow down, but at the same time we have 30 minutes and I have to go through a lot of stuff. Um, basically, I, I was asked to talk about Privacy Shield and um, we called it Lipstick on a Pig because it's the old Safe Harbor Agreement. Um, a bit of a background story probably on that. Um, what is Safe Harbor and what was the whole story behind all of this? Um, we did have the surveillance um, slides that Snowden disclosed, where we basically knew that a couple of the big IT companies um, take part in a program that's called PRISM, which is um, a US surveillance system, basically. An interesting thing here is that from a legal perspective, I'm a lawyer, the big problem is a lot of that was oftentimes conspiracy, hard to prove in courts, and if you want to bring a case, you need to have very, very solid evidence. Because if you're the claimant, you have to prove stuff. So if you just walk around and say, oh, there's a law, and they could and they may, it's not going to be good enough. The interesting thing with um, the disclosures by Snowden were that we actually had slides, we actually had evidence that made sense that we could actually present to a court. And that was the only reason this whole case ever happened is because of Snowden. Um, thanks for that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and the, um, that was kind of the factual side that we knew that these companies basically um, forward data to US government. Um, the interesting thing from a legal perspective is how legally that works in the US. And there's oftentimes talk about US law, and I just want to kind of summarize that real quick. It's not 100% precise, but it gives you an idea how the law in the US works. It basically says that there needs to be a so-called electronic communication service provider. So that's your Google, Facebook, and so on. And the interesting thing is these surveillance laws do not apply to an ordinary business, to the, you know, airline or something that sends data to the US. We're actually very specific in the surveillance law on electronic communication service providers. And they need to have what they call foreign intelligence information. And that is very broad um, um, wording that basically includes anything that the US may be interested in for diplomatic reasons and so on. So it's not very specific. It's not your terrorist or something. It's basically espionage and all of that as well. And that's pretty much the two things you need under FISA. 
Um, on top of that, and all of the stuff that's below that line is then classified, there's a so-called certification for one year. Now, typically the US says, yeah, there's legal process when we have surveillance, there's some court involved, but what that court does, the FISA court, is that it certifies a surveillance program for a whole year. It doesn't look at individual surveillance at the individual person that is actually surveilled, it just certifies a program like Upstream or PRISM for a whole year. That's all the court does. It doesn't look at the individual case where data is actually pulled. Um, the whole idea of that is that there are so-called minimization and targeting procedures that basically filter out the U.S. persons. So anybody that lives in the U.S. or is a U.S. citizen. If you're European, this whole minimizing and targeting procedure doesn't apply to you, so you're not protected on any, any of that. The reason for that is if you would have surveillance that goes as far as FISA does for U.S. people, you would actually violate the Fourth Amendment under the U.S. Constitution. So all of what the U.S. does right now would be unconstitutional if they would do it on U.S. citizens, but since um, fundamental rights in the U.S. doesn't apply to foreigners, they can do it with us. And that's the whole idea of this whole minimization targeting procedures is to filter them out. And then there is a so-called directive at a service provider. Um, it doesn't specifically so say in the law what it does and how it works, but it's basically telling a service provider that there has to be some technical interface to pull the data. That's the order that goes to an individual service provider saying, you have to give us the data. That's not done by the court, that's actually done by the US government, that order. Um, the court actually just um, certifies the whole surveillance program once a year. So if I'm that little smiley down here and I'm a Facebook customer and I have a contract with Facebook Island, my data actually goes straight to the servers of Facebook Inc., the US parent company. And there are two ways that the data, as far as we know yet, but there could be legally more ways, um, two ways where we're sure that um, data is pulled. That's basically upstream where they pull it on the cable. And then there's Prism where they pull it from the service off the service provider. Um, Prism makes sense if you, for example, have it encrypted. That way you can still pull it from the service if you can't get it through upstream. Upstream is much broader. Both of that works under Pfizer. Upstream can possibly also go under, um, work under 12333 in executive order. That's the two legal basis for that. Um, and there are a couple of guidelines and stuff I'm going to touch later. Um, but that's the legal basis and that's what we have to look at. So um, there are a couple of th things that are disputed that we don't know yet. The exact technical implementation, the amount of data that's really pulled, the review mechanisms that are internal because all of that is classified and we don't have any proof of it. There's a lot of rumors, a lot of hints, but not really anything that was solid. Now that was basically what Snowden disclosed and um, what was interesting to me were the reactions. We had um, demonstrations, we had the European Parliament doing resolutions, the European Commission did a wonderful review, Merkel was pissed about her phone, and that was basically the reaction. And um, we knew that this is not going to go far, um, so the idea was how can we make a legal case out of this? And that was the original safe harbor case at the Court of Justice, and the strategic approach there was kind of interesting. Um, if you bring a case like that, you have to be very strategic because you're going to go against a big government and you have to find some point where you can hit without having 100 lawyers scream back at you and you're kind of messed up. But you need to find like the one little bit where you can actually pull in and where you can actually get stuff done. So the interesting thing was that we actually have a situation of public-private surveillance partnership. We have um, the internet service providers that get the data and the government that pulls it from them. So it's this um, combination of private and public that was interesting legally. Um, then the interesting thing is in our case, Facebook was subject to US law and EU law. They're headquartered in Ireland. 84% um, of their users are operated out of Ireland. So you can say it's an 84% European company. So I guess they have to follow European law. At the same time, their mother company is in the US. So they have to follow that law at the same time. And EU law regulates third country transfers. So if you have personal data in the European Union, you're not allowed to send it to any third country unless you have some legal way to actually protect the data. So it's basically an export control on personal data. Um, and finally, all this EU law has to be interpreted under our fundamental rights treaties. So that was interesting because even if one company sends data to another company, you have all your fundamental rights applying in this transfer. And this overall connection actually made this case possible. Another feature of European law that was very interesting for us is that the definitions in European law are very broad. So for example, processing data already is um, just making data available. So one thing in our whole legal strategy was to, to never claim that I was actually surveilled by the NSA. I was only saying my data has to be made available to the NSA by Facebook under US law. 
And that is the interesting thing if you go very abstract in the case and you kind of try to say the only thing I have to prove is that they have to make it available, not that they actually pulled my data, then you actually leave a lot out of the case that you couldn't possibly prove, prove otherwise. And that's the interesting thing because that's exactly the difference to US law. There you typically have to prove all these, these things that you cannot prove and therefore your case is going to go nowhere. So the interesting thing is because European law is much broader in their definitions, you could actually bring a case that you would never be able to bring in the US. The other thing that was interesting for us is we basically compared PRISM to data retention and said the surveillance under um, PRISM is just basically 10 times as bad as data retention, and if data retention was illegal in the European Union, then PRISM has to be 10 times as illegal. Basically go through the different things that the Court of Justice was interested in. Um, a fundamental thing I think that everybody has to understand to talk about these data transfer issues is we have a, actually, on a very meta level, we have a conflict of law situation here. Basic European law says you need to have privacy on Facebook servers in very simple terms, and US law says you have to have surveillance on the, same, on the same data. And that is the fundamental conflict of all these cases. We have basically a conflict of jurisdiction. One country screams at Facebook, say, we need surveillance. The other country screams at Facebook and says, you can't do that. And that is the fundamental clash that we actually have in this whole area. It's very different than in the private sector. In the private sector, um, there's basically no general data protection law in the US. Europe has that. And because there's no conflict, there's simply a gap. Companies in the US could actually fill that through self-certification. So we have to separate between the private sector that we can fix and the government sector that we can only fix if we change either European fundamental rights or US surveillance laws. Both is not overly likely right now. Um, what was the legal argument that we brought? Um, if my data goes over to Facebook, this data can only leave the European Union, that's this export control thing, if there's so-called adequate protection in a third country. And my legal argument was very simple. You don't have to study law for that. I was basically walking up to the court and said, mass surveillance is not adequate protection. Full stop. Um, <laughs> so how did the procedure go down? Under Safe Harbor, you could actually go to a private arbitration service called Trustee. And you had to file a complaint with them first. So I filed a complaint, but because you could only have 100, I think 250 characters at the most, the only thing I could say is stop Facebook Inc's involvement in prison. That was the legal argument I could possibly make in that small little box. And they came back to me saying the trustee does not have any authority to address the issue because a private company can hardly tell the NSA to stop what it's doing. So the next place you've got to go is the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. That's the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, my most favorite slide of any presentation. It's actually, that's a supermarket and the little, red, uh, the little blue door on the very right, that's the Irish DPC. And um, the interesting thing with the Irish DPC, they now got a new office because that picture was in the media too much, so they got a fancier office. Um, but at the time, Billy Hawks, their, their main, um, the, their, their, their head, um, was actually going on to national radio in Ireland and said, I don't think it will come as much of a surprise that in fact US intelligence services do have access from US companies. And that was amazing because he agreed on public radio that factually we're absolutely right. And the big problem in any privacy case is to get the facts right. The facts are always the big issue. The law is kind of the smaller issue. So he went on to national radio recorded saying all these facts are actually true. We know that there is surveillance. Um, so that was the most important thing. That's the reason we also went with Ireland. We also filed in Germany, for example. And there, I think the authorities are still investigating a case or something like that. Um, but he was stupid enough to walk out into public and say, yeah, obviously there is all this surveillance. He just felt that legally there is no problem. Um, so we appealed that to the Irish High Court, that's that, um, and had our hearing there. And what basically happened in Ireland is that they approved all the facts and passed it on to the European Court of Justice. That's the highest court in the European Union. And um, because safe harbor and the validity of it was at stake, they had to refer to the Court of Justice. Um, at the Court of Justice, we actually had a very long one-day hearing. It was really interesting to see how, um, how the kind of detailed the knowledge was of the judges there. I was, because that's oftentimes the problem in privacy cases is that the judges don't really know what all of this is. And in this case, we're actually really happy with the judges and, and their understanding of it. Um, and kind of a little side note, I think it was funny. Um, a day before the hearing, there were a couple of people texting me saying, from different member states, texting me, um, guess who was just calling us? 
I was like, I don't know. And the answer was, ah, someone from the US government was calling us that we should change our position because the member states can all um, um, put their views um, before the court as well. And apparently the US government has tried to push tremendously the day before to change their positions. Um, but it was too late, everybody was already on their planes, so it was, uh, they couldn't do anything. And at the hearing actually there was someone from the US mission um, and he approached me and I was like, hey, how are you doing? And he was like, oh, you're the plaintiff. And I was like, yeah, you're the watchdog from the US. Nice to meet you. And um, we were chatting and it was funny because I was like, um, you know, and do you still need any phone numbers to call around and tell people what to say in front of the court or are you done doing that? And the fun thing is if you're a student, you can say things like that, that the diplomats are not allowed to say. And, um, and he actually agreed then and said, yeah, we had to kind of make sure that our position is, is, is heard. Um, but he said that they only found out about the hearing on Friday night. Then there was the weekend. Then they only had Monday to intervene anymore, which was way too late. And on Tuesday, the actual hearing happened. So they were simply too late to intervene anymore, even though that hearing, I think, was on the web page of the Court of Justice for three weeks. So they have all their wonderful surveillance, but they don't even find out when the actual court date is happening. Um, but... <laughs> So that was fun. Um, a really interesting thing happened to the Court of Justice as well. The judgment came out, I think, only two weeks after the Advocate General. At the Court of Justice, there is an Advocate General that gives a general opinion about um, the case, and then there is the actual judgment. And typically, that takes two or three months. And we heard rumors that there's going to be a judgment um, on, I think, October 6th. And I was like, this is crazy. It's like two days, two weeks or three weeks after the Advocate General. That never happens. It's like totally exceptional. And the rumor goes that the former um, president of the Court of Justice that retired on the 7th of October, the day later, wanted to push that judgment out before he retires as I like his goodbye present. Um, so it was actually really interesting to see how apparently judges get very emotional about these privacy cases, which is very good news in the long run if we want to go to the Court of Justice in the future as well. Um, so what did the Court of Justice say? It's actually had a very, very bold um, judgment. It said two things. First of all, it said that mass surveillance violates the essence of Article 7, which is the um, right to privacy under the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and that there, the lack of legal redress, so there's no court to go to and appeal anything, violates the essence of your Article 47 rights, which is your fair trial. And I may know that this is only exciting to me, um, because I'm a lawyer, but in EU law there is so-called proportionality tests. So you test how, if a law is proportionate or not. And if you have, for example, um, data retention, it may be somewhere in the disproportionate area or may be proportionate and so on. However, you can have a violation of the essence, which is kind of no way this is ever going to be justifiable what you do here, no matter how many people you can save from being dead or whatever. It's simply a violation of the essence, so it's outside of even debating proportionality. And our case was the first time where the Court of Justice found that there's a violation of the essence of any fundamental right. Um, in this case, the right to privacy. So, so obviously we argued that, but if, if you're at the Court of Justice and you get that judgment handed down, everybody's reading something and someone, some other lawyer screamed out, just like, fuck, we got the essence! And we're like, strike! <laughs> and so, so anyways, that's, you know, well, you're fun, but anyways. Um, the other stuff that was interesting was that they said that the third country has to have essentially equivalent protection um, as the European Union. And that's interesting because, as I said before, the law only talks about adequate protection. And adequate is not a legally really meaningful word. Adequate, anything and nothing can be adequate. So um, what actually happened in the law, it said equivalent originally, then it was lobbied out in the 90s to adequate, because that means nothing, and now the court basically lobbied it back in into essential equivalent, and basically put the law back of where it was. Um, they said that there had to be effective detection and supervision mechanisms, and um, they also said that there have to be, has to be legal redress in line with Article 47. Now, this is very interesting because none of the European Union countries that has Syrian surveillance does any of the above. Um, so they actually went very far in how, like for example, if I'm an Austrian citizen and I'm surveilled by the German services, there is nothing like that in Germany where I could possibly appeal to. How does that happen? Um, the EU treaties um, have an exception for national security. So anything that is in the national security area is exempt from EU law. The member states never gave that part to the European Union. So 
the court of justice can rule about national security of a third country, because that's not exempt from EU law, but it cannot rule about national security of our own member states, which is a totally absurd situation. Um, but that's the reason why basically the US, uh, uh, the Germany or France or so, um, gets along with it without really having a problem. I'm going to get back to that later. Um, at least with the UK, that is a thing that is solved by Brexit because then they're a third country and we can bring a case there as well. Um, but, you know, you've got to look at the bright side of Brexit too. Um, so actually, that's all the pre-story to get to the stuff I should actually talk about, um, which is Privacy Shield or called Safe Harbor 2.0. I usually call it Safe Harbor 1.0.1 or something like that, because it's basically the same text. Um, what happened um, when Safe Harbor was kicked down is basically that the US became like any other third country we transfer data to. So it simply just lost the special status it had before through the treaty. Um, and there are still different possibilities to send data to the US. So for example, you can use consent, performance of a contract, so-called SEC, standard contractual clauses, binding corporate rules, and so on. So it's not like you couldn't send data to the US anymore. It was just not that easy. You had to use different legal mechanisms. Um, the Facebook actually switched to SCCs, and we have a case right now pending in Ireland where the Irish Data Protection Commissioner sued me and Facebook um, over the standard contractual clauses. It's still the same complaint as the original case, where right now um, we had about four we five weeks in courts in Dublin beginning of this year with about 20 solicitors and barristers. Um, we had about 45,000 pages produced in this case. Um, we expect about five to 10 million in costs for this legal battle for the second round where I got sued. Like, I didn't start this, the DPC started that. Um, and there's gonna be a second reference. We're still fighting over what the question is. So actually the whole case is gonna go back up to the Court of Justice a second time around, just on another legal basis. Um, I, I can't really talk much about this case because it's a pending case, but let's say Facebook totally fucked up in that procedure. <laughs> they had like all their wonderful experts with thousands of pages, and when it was before the court, you just had to look at the footnotes and you're like, guys, you're actually saying this is in the footnote, but it's not there, you just made it up. And it was amazing to see how they have incredibly well-paid lawyers, but they don't check their own stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's really, they just, apparently they're so full of themselves that they think we're gonna get away with anything. Um, however, the judge didn't let them get, get away, so the most important part to me is that actually the judgment that we had in the first round, that's already, kind of um, fixed so I can talk about it, actually, again, says that there is mass and indiscriminate processing by the US government. So that is actually what they challenge, where they say there is no mass surveillance, and it says exactly that again. So on the whole factual stuff, they lost again. Um, Beck, that's kind of a little side story. <laughs> um, back to the actual um, privacy shield. Um, how did that thing actually happen? I think you need to understand the history of Privacy Shield to explain why it's bullshit. Um, on January 31st, little fairy tale, um, there was a deadline by the European Data Protection Authorities. And January 31st at night, the New York Times reports um, that EU and US couldn't agree on any kind of new deal. And I was talking to the reporter and he said he got that information um, in a way that he knows it's 100% it's certain. So apparently on the 31st, the two sides stood up from the, ta from the table and said there's no agreement, we can't agree on anything here. Anything here. 48 hours later, there was apparently a phone call between the US government and the European Commission and someone was told that you're about the responsible um, uh, um, commissioner should just get anything done. And 48 hours later, the same New York Times with the same reporter reports that there is now a new deal. Um, and we didn't really know the name yet, but 24 hours later, there was suddenly this logo, and it was called Privacy Shield. And I was talking to people that negotiated, and it was like, how did you come up with this shitty name? And he said, I didn't know about the name until that actual press conference, because that deal didn't exist. It was simply a logo with a name and no actual deal. Um, we know that because one week later, Epic, a US privacy NGO, made a freedom of information request with the US government asking for the actual text of that deal. And they got a response, I think two days later, um, saying that they cannot have the, the text because the record that you requested does not exist. Um, so, one month later, there was actually a text, um, and it's basically safe harbor again. 
Um, it's the same text, most of it is one-on-one -on -one the same, like if you would do a red line comparison of it, probably 5% would be new text. All the rest is basically the same. Um, and they just put a new name on it, call it a privacy shield, and that's why I basically think it's lipstick on a pig. Um, what's the problem with privacy shield? If that gets ever back to the court of justice, so basically the idea of pig meets court, um, how would that go down? Um, under what the, the, the judgment by the court of justice, there are two hurdles that privacy shield would have to overcome. Um, one hurdle is basically this essential equivalence, which is important in the, in the, in the, in the private sector, and then it also has to be compliant with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is relevant for mass surveillance. Um, just two or three examples why this would not work. Um, Privacy Shield still follows the so-called notice and choice principle in the US. Not consent, not a legal basis to process data, but notice and choice, which is a very kind of, um, yeah, not very stringent system. Um, in a very simple graphic, on the left, all these types of data processing are covered under EU law, from collecting the data all the way to deleting it. Anything you would do with data is covered by the law. And you need a legal basis for that. Under Privacy Shield, you only need an opt to provide an opt-out, so you don't even need to ask for consent, any other legal basis. You only have to provide for an opt-out if you disclose data to someone else or if you change the purpose of the data processing. So if you just compare these two things together, you can say, oh, this is absolutely not essentially equivalent. Basically, the one thing is teeny tiny protection and the other one is full protection. Um, if you compare that, if you collect data, use it, store it, all of that is not even covered. You don't need any legal basis. You can just do it under Privacy Shield. Um, only if you then disclose or change the purpose, then you can actually, you actually need to provide an opt-out. So you don't even have to, have to ask for consent. You just need to have some opt-out box on some web page that no one finds. Um, and you can even kill these two things by simply putting a very broad purpose into your privacy policy, saying we use the data for anything we want to use it, so you will never have to change the purpose if it's that broad. And you basically have a third-party clause where it says you can send the data to anybody else. And thereby, you have basically unlimited data processing under Privacy Shield, which is, should officially be the same thing as European Union law. Um, so it will not, not add up ever. The other thing that was interesting was redress. And I think that kind of displays quite well how this is never going to work in practice. Because imagine I want to get a beef with Facebook for the 21st time. And I write my funny little complaint to Facebook. They have 45 days to send me a letter back saying, fuck off. And that's what they typically do. Then I can complain to Trusty. We already know them before. That's the guys with the 20, 250 characters to complain about stuff. They're actually chosen and paid for by Facebook, but they're officially independent. So I can complain with them. If my complaint is upheld, they tell Facebook not to do stuff anymore, but it's not enforceable. It's basically an email to Facebook saying, don't do this anymore. If they further do it, there is no consequence, there is no way. They also don't have investigative power, so they cannot figure out what Facebook actually does on its servers. They can only look at whatever I bring up, and I'm usually not able to gonna, gonna be able to bring up much. Um, if I'm unhappy with that, I can go to my national DPA in Europe, and they can then raise the issue with the Department of Commerce in the US in an informal procedure. Again, the Department of Commerce doesn't have any investigative powers. So let's say I made an access request, said I want to have a copy of all my data. Facebook doesn't send anything back. None of these guys can actually find out what Facebook actually stores on their servers to then decide over my access request. Um, if I'm with the Irish DPC, I first have to go to court to sue them to actually do all of that, because they would never do that anyways. Um, and all of them can theoretically go to the Federal Trade Commission, which again doesn't really have too much enforcement powers and not a lot of investigative powers, but definitely more than the others. Um, but the FTC already said they're not going to do that if they don't like it, and they haven't done that so far. So basically all of that is all in gray because you don't get anywhere with all of this. Now, on top of all of that, and you have to go through all the other things before, before you can appeal to the so-called Privacy Shield panel, which is going to be about 10 or 15 lawyers or something like that, and you can call with, you can have a Skype call, basically, with them, a video conference, um, and talk with them over your privacy concern. And even their decision is not going to be legally binding, but you would then have to transfer that through an American court into a legally binding American decision. And all of this is probably going to take three or four years to just get your fucking access requests. Um, so that is the enforcement mechanism of Privacy Shield, which makes sure that even if you violate any of these rules that you can hardly violate, there is no way you will ever get your rights in the end. Um, the interesting thing here is also a question of fair competition. Now, um, we have people on the European market 
that can run under this system instead of really following um, the European rules. And I think that's also an issue that our companies now have to follow GDPR, all these fancy privacy laws we have, um, and US companies don't. The most interesting part, actually, of that whole privacy shield thing is the whole surveillance issue. And the European Commission made a very interesting assessment and had a press release when they put up Privacy Shield saying that US, US authorities assured that there is no indiscriminate or mass surveillance by national security authorities. So we now know we're safe. If you look into the Privacy Shield, actually, there is Annex 6, page 4, that says that there is um, so-called bulk surveillance for six specific purposes. So in the press release, they said there is no mass surveillance, but now there is bulk surveillance in Annex 6, page 4. Um, and that is for, um, a lot of, for six purposes that are very broad. For example, the last one here is combating transnational criminal threats. So you just need a crime that goes across a border and a threat of such a crime. You don't even need a crime. So just the fact that Mexicans may throw dr drugs over the border is such a trans -criminal, transnational criminal threat that already allows mass surveillance. Um, so if you look at the definitions, they're huge, really, really broad. However, um, they say that this is the rules for bulk surveillance, and there are only six purposes, but the word bulk actually has a footnote five. And lawyers love footnotes, so you follow that. And if you follow that footnote, they actually say that these limitations only apply if data is not temporarily, temporarily acquired to later facilitate targeted surveillance. So, the overall story is if I collect all the data in bulk first to later target someone within that bulk, then it's not mass surveillance. And that is the interesting thing, and that's basically where the definition goes differently. The US basically has that view, if you have an if you have your, I don't know, your browser, and you just type in one URL, you obviously only have access to one page at a time. So your browser doesn't give you access to internet, to the bulk of the whole internet, but only to one page at a time, so therefore it's not bulk collection of data. That's kind of the idea that they try to um, put up, and therefore you basically get out of the whole system. Um, finally, I'm kind of short with my time. What they did um, is that because it would be impossible that the, US, uh, that the European Union would um, put all of that into their own finding. What they did is they basically got a letter from the US and annexed the letter from the US to the decision. So what they basically did is they asked a foreign government to approve that their law is great, put that in a letter, and annex it to European Union decision. If you would do that with China, you would basically ask China to give you a letter how great your, uh, the fundamental rights in China are. You annex that to a European Union decision and say, obviously, the law in China is great because the Chinese government sent us a letter saying it is. And that's basically how they got uh, around all these issues. Uh, very final issue um, that I want to bring up is that you can now complain to a so-called privacy shield ombudsperson. That's not a court or anything, but an ombudsperson in the US State Department, so the Foreign Department. And um, that goes through the national DPA. The fun part of all of the, this is you, the answer you'll get from this redress mechanism, and that's the only new redress mechanism in Privacy Shield, is already pre-described in Privacy Shield. And the answer is going to be the same answer no matter what your case is. And the answer will be, first of all, that it has been investigated. Secondly, they will tell you that they either complied with the law or changed their behavior. They're not going to tell you if they complied with the law. They only said either we complied with the law or we're going to change, do that differently in the future. And then they will neither confirm nor deny that there was any surveillance anyways. And that is your wonderful redress that should apparently fulfill um, your right to redress on the European Union law. I'm going to jump through that. Snowden was pissed about it as well. You can read that on Twitter yourself. Um, one last thing that I want to talk about is how to kill Privacy Shield, because if anybody in this room wants to kill it, there's a l very easy way to do that, and I'm encouraging anybody to do that. Um, you can basically file an injunction against an internet service provider at your local European court and basically claim the Privacy Shield is invalid and request a reference to the Court of Justice, because your local court will have to refer a case like that to the Court of Justice. Um, and then you can basically focus on the commercial things because that's much easier to challenge than the mass surveillance. And then you basically just have to sit back and relax. So if anybody in this room wants to go to the Court of Justice, I'm happily assisting you. And um, finally, I need to jump to the very last part because um, we're right now, that's the part about US, uh, European surveillance, I told you that already. There is actually a way to um, probably get these courses. Uh, there is no jurisdiction for mass surveillance in Europe 
um, by the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, but there is a possibility to bring the same cases with the same legal rationale to Strasbourg. And we already had the first case going up where they cited our case. So I think for European surveillance, this whole case was very important as well, but we're just going to need a different court to go to. The very last thing, um, sorry, but I have to pitch something. Um, we just started a privacy enforcement NGO. Um, we're looking for donations on that, actually for memberships, because I do all of this for free, but to do cases like that and actually win stuff, we need to have a team on a European level that does shit like that. Um, especially we're looking into the commercial sector, we are working together with the NGOs that already exist um, nationally, but the idea is to really do stuff on a European level. Very quick pitch because I'm over my time. Questions, please ask me personally because we're over time anyway. Sorry! <laughs> Let's have... Thank you. Okay, thank you, Max.